so welcome welcome to the second part of think like a data prepper uh, as we went over yesterday that was looking more in terms of why do we need to think about self-service data preparation so hopefully i've kind of lured you over to the side of actually this stuff you can do yourself you don't have to wait for for others to do it and it's really really empowering if you can go and start forming those data sources that you want to use yourself rather than having to wait for other people to do it um, so just an overview of what we're going to go through today we're going to go through kind of the four different stages that i go through when when planning and, and working on a piece of data preparation all of that comes from um, this article on how to plan your prep so that's the second part of the kind of how to prep guide that I've got kicking around on prep and data, which is on a weekly challenge. I'll go into that in a bit more detail soon. That's um, that's all in this post, as I mentioned. If uh, Zoom lets me go and click there, that'd be really useful. <laughs> um, so it's in this how to um, plan your prep stage. So there's, there'll be more detail in this article and, and things to think about, but, but all in all, um, there's a bit more detail there. Over time, that's what we're actually then forming into this book. So this is this is what we're looking to complete by October, and I'm having a lot of fun pulling that all together at the moment. So lots of it will be based on the blog posts, but then neatened up and, and made it a lot easier to put together rather than kind of my ramblings on the blog posts. So uh, that'll be neatened up quite a lot. So let's let's kind of go and have a look at the the content we'll go through today again. Kind of talk about the theory of what's going on first of all but then off the back of that what we'll do is how do we then actually apply that to a real world situation so i don't i don't just kind of want to talk theory here i like to then go and show how that's actually applied to, to what we're going to do so this session is all about thinking about how do you go and plan plan your preparation so yesterday we saw you know why why you should be looking at that self-service data prep and and trying to just work with it and how tableau prep's a great tool for that but now we kind of take that next step on which is all right i want to use it how do i go about that and again how do you break down some of these challenges with data preparation to go and take some pretty messy inputs and get them ready for analysis and really this like i say this is just the approach i go through each time so Tomorrow we'll go into then shaping your data and, and looking more about more of the functionality within prep when it comes to actually manipulating the data set you've got. And then the last session, so Thursday, we're going to go into why do you not need prep at all? So kind of what can we still do within desktop and where should we look to Tableau desktop rather than actually having to use Tableau prep to do something? And with Tableau prep building in more functionality and also desktop changing a little bit over time, those, those areas flex and change. So that, that's why we want to go and have a look at that, just to, again, know that you're using the right tool for the right job. As I say, prep and data is a great follow on from these talks as to actually then going and applying some of that knowledge. I'm still really conscious and they came from a financial services background where lots of data is locked down and, and people make it intentionally difficult to work with some of this data. Because at the end of the day, um, how do I put this? It can be dangerous if you kind of manipulate data wrongly, overwrite other people's data. Prep tries to reduce that risk a lot. And actually that risk is normally reduced by actually controls that you have around the data. So what Jonathan and I were really tempted to do when we created prep and data was just create this kind of free space for people to learn, try, nothing really can go wrong within that because it's not real world data. So we're using real world examples, but then we've mocked up data sets for that. So yeah, there's an archive of 60 challenges and a new one is out tomorrow. And obviously all the how-to posts are there too. So why are we talking about Tableau Prep? Quick recap from yesterday. Well, when we talk about Tableau Prep, we're talking about two different tools, Prep Builder, where we're actually doing the work, building those logical flows, and then Prep Conductor, where those flows are being run on the server, maybe on a schedule or being shared with your colleagues. The product was released in April 2018 and it's been on a monthly release cadence since then. So lots of changes come in each month. The fundamentals largely stay the same, but there is lots of new functionality each month that's coming up. Another reason to do those prep and data challenges to kind of stay abreast of what's working and uh, what's new within the tool. But really the aim of prep is to be super simple. We saw yesterday the seven different types of steps that we can actually make within prep. And actually by boiling everything down to seven simplistic steps, 
it's very easy to go and find the right thing in the right place. Um, so it's really lowered that barrier to entry where previously we had to do quite a lot of coding or maybe we had an absolute plethora of different choices to make. And that kind of became its own barrier of having to learn quite a lot before we dive into this. Whereas prep, yep, it's simplifying that process for us. But it's also doing the kind of major part of data prep, which is taking that repeatable steps where we're having to do that manually, maybe at the moment, or coding each time, and actually turning that into something where we just press play once we've got that logic worked out. And today we're going through how do we actually go and work out what that logic actually is. And then, you know, for Tableau users, prep is this nice familiar interface where we're kind of used to working um, with where we're at already similar calculation interfaces, functionality, syntax, all of that loveliness, as well as Tableau's visual interface where, as we saw yesterday, we can explore data really nicely and see what's within our data set, see those errors that are kicking around, but also then go and make those changes from it. So if I'm planning my prep, what do I need to do? So like I said, there's, there's actually four steps within this process. And the first one that I always go for is know your data. Now this is actually true of Tableau desktop as well as Tableau prep. But if you don't know your data, how are you actually gonna make your right decisions? And for quite a long time, I taught data prep as you investigate it using, um, for me, SQL for quite a while, but then it became investigating using Excel or whatever tools we had to hand. But it was actually teaching, um, one of the data school cohorts quite a while ago, I started need to step back and was like, let's just start sketching out the data. You tell me what's within the data set. And I found really quickly that that process of having to physically draw out the data set made a massive difference. So what data set we're gonna to use today is this data set at the top of the screen here. So I've got uh, the data taken from our prep and data challenges. I think it's week six, 2019. And what we have within that is an individual branch and um, that branch we've got two different branches within Lewisham um, so if we want to potentially think about how we deal with that two different products slightly messy data within there and then we've got a different column for each of our months and that column for each of the months is scarily common within data sets where people are supplying that data to you it kind of takes a little bit of work to unpick that re-manipulate that some nice steps within here but really to go and know your data, you've got to go and look at actually what's there. And there's a few things that I kind of look for within this. And actually when I started sketching that, the actual art of sketching and having to draw out that data set makes you think of the right things at the right time. Because when you're sketching a data set, the first thing that you do is you start drawing columns and you think about how many columns you actually have within your data set. What's there, what's not. What does each column contain? Because I don't know about you, but the first time I then go and sketch out a data set, I want to just go and put the header of that column in there. So I'm actually reflecting what's within my actual data set, but I'm just actually going and doing that kind of drawing to say what's there. I then kind of can't help myself. I look down and see what those values are within, within that data. So not only am I working out what that structure is, but I'm also then thinking about what those data types actually are. So in this case, I'm seeing a whole load of strings, I'm seeing some common fields or common names of branches, but I've just got an underscore one or an underscore two. I just start thinking about the right things at the right time of just adding little bits of complexity as I go through. And this works really well with really large data sets as well as small data sets. You notice here that when I sketched this, this table out, I didn't necessarily feel like I need to sketch all of those different dates. I showed that there was more dates to come, but um, that the fact I've got kind of more and more dates going on from that. But I'm also looking for my values. You'll notice that I'm kind of coloring and shading the blue and the green, very much like dimensions and measures or discrete or continuous within Tableau. I'm thinking about not only how my data is structured right now, but actually how would I want to use it within Tableau. So with Tableau Desktop, uh, blue things are the things that are breaking down my view, those dimensions, those discrete fields. And then the green things are continuous measures as such, are continuous fields. They're drawing axes if they're based on columns or rows, or they're the numbers within my tables, etc. So having that little bit of fundamental knowledge about Tableau Desktop 
I can then start to think about how this data set might be used as I bring it through. Because the first thing I start thinking about is, is the structure of these dates. You won't see many Tableau data sets that have an individual column per, per month, or per day, and that's for a really strong reason. We'll come to that in a bit. But it's that art of sketching, and just, you don't have to do beautiful sketches. Like I'm just doing this on my iPad really quickly, but if you've got pen and pencil, um, it doesn't overly matter. Just find a scrap of paper and just sketch out what that data set potentially looks like. And you really quickly start to spot kind of key issues and differences um, within that data set as you're working through, whether you're seeing decimal places or not. Um, finding that structure, then finding the data types that you have within that massively helps. And step two is then going to completely the other end of the scale. Because so at the end of the day, sketch step one, where you're sketching that first input, you're actually thinking about really how that data is going to be coming into your, either your prep flow, do you need to prep it? or how it's going to flow into Tableau Desktop. Whereas stage two is going, okay, now that I know that, what do I actually want this thing to be? Well, in our case of our example that we have at the moment, I've just dropped that down into our bottom corner, so hopefully you can see that. We still have our branch. We're thinking about the branches, how do I need to have that? And when I'm thinking about my branches, actually I want to pull those Lewisham values all together. So I'll get rid of the underscore one or, or the underscore two. So I've got some cleanup to do there. So I want that single town name. I take that initial sketch and actually think about just redrawing what that desired state would actually be. And then just dropping myself a few notes to just start thinking about what those prep steps are that I'm going through. So again, I'm capturing the structure. I'm actually naming the data type that I want to bring this into my to my work as to how do I want that data to be structured and, and held. So what functions might I need to, to use to either convert that data type or to do that correct levels of cleaning. I'm still putting those example values into the view just to again get me thinking about what those steps are that I might want to make as I go through here. Otherwise it just becomes potentially really messy for what's going on. My dates, obviously date structure is really important. How frequent do I actually have my dates? Well, I've got my month year values here. Um, and because I want to use my dates within Tableau Desktop, then I know that I need to get them all into one column. One column gives us and opens up all of that flexibility that we have within dates of picking those individual date parts or those date values, um, or even just kind of using Tableau's internal calendar to work out what day of the week it is. That used to take me quite a lot of time of coding within SQL to break all of that down. And last but not least, what else do I have left over in my data? Well, I've just got my sales numbers. They're going to be held as an integer so I can get rid of some of those decimal places that we saw in our data set before. Um, so I can just round those numbers up, make life a lot simpler for me. But it's these notes as to what changes I'll need to make or check what's going on within my data set as I take it through prep that helps me understand what, that, what form that's going to take and also what I'm likely to need to do. And that really flows beautifully into step three. What are those logical transitions to get from my, my known data state for that input through to where I want to get my desired state of that data to be before I start analyzing it? So in this case, it's kind of referring almost between the two different sketches that you had. The sketch of your input, the sketch of your desired state, and working out a few particular parts within there. So what are we gonna to have to pivot to go and make a single date column and the values off to the back of that. What techniques will I have to do? Now, a big piece here is not necessarily knowing exactly what you're gonna do within Tableau Prep. If you are newer to the tool, you might not know how certain things are gonna work or what's gonna happen when. That really doesn't matter at this stage. Because we saw yesterday with the changes log or with the even steps, and I'll show you today how we can disconnect the steps and reconnect them as well you can go and build out whatever the different steps are. And you might wanna think what might happen first or what, what might happen later and put it in some kind of logical order. But actually if that order isn't perfect, it really doesn't matter. I really want you to, to kind of go and simplify the, high, uh, the, the process. Think about those kind of key changes and transitions you're gonna to have to go through from that input to the output. And that's really what your plan actually is. Because as long as you can kind of break down those kind of key bullet points of what's going to happen when, what do I need to think about, 
you're in a really good position to then go and work on it. Because like I say, if you're new to this, you might not have all of those techniques in your kit bag. But actually knowing that I'm going to need to pivot and I'm going to go and take a whole load of columns and put them into rows, if I haven't done dealt with that columns to row pivot before, it becomes a hell of a lot easier to go and Google the right terminology or the right techniques or find what you might need to do rather than feeling forced and trapped by, oh, there's, there's too many things going on here. I, I don't know where to go. So breaking everything down into mini challenges that you're then putting together those transitions will make life a lot easier off the back of that. So just a quick question from Ramesh around what's KYD, what does that mean? It means know your data. So that's just referring back to that first step of if you know your data, understand the basics behind that, you are good to go. I come from a financial services background. We have a lovely process called Know Your Customer, KYC. It's been bled into me for years. So I mean, that's a terrible pun and play on that concept. So yeah, just fully understand what's going on um, within, within that input data is really key as well as knowing where you want to go and move those transitions to. So if you've got your plan, you really are then ready to go and build it. And like I say, it's this breakdown into those key individual steps and working your way through to understand what's there and what's not. What do you have to do? What don't you have to tackle? Makes life so much easier. But like I say, that, that don't, don't forget about that iteration piece. I don't think there's many data challenges that I've taken on, whether it's prepping or visualization, that I've actually got right first time. And I think it's really difficult to do that or you get really lucky. Um, but often as you're building something, you're going to ask different questions of what you're doing. You're going to go and look at something in a different way. You're going to go and find something you weren't expecting. That's absolutely fine. Prep is fast. It's quick to iterate. It's using that sample. And as long as you're on a decently powered laptop or computer, you're going to be in a good stage to go and work with this data pretty quickly. So you can iterate. You can play around. You can try things and delete them. That's absolutely fine. Please don't be afraid to do that. You can't do too much damage in that way. So let's, let's go and look at what we're actually going to go and take on for our kind of our deep dive. So in, in this kind of sample data set that I'm going to go and use, I'm going to go and take a data set that kind of has our profits per month, per country and per category. Again, this is taken from a prep and data challenge. So we're, I'm going to go and show you how I work through those, those kind of four steps that know your data step, the desired state, trying to work out what that would look like, Detail out a little bit more, our logical transitions, and then we're actually going to go and build that. Um, so again, feel free to follow along with this off the back of the, the webinar. I wouldn't try and keep up with what I'm going to try and do. So step one, know your data. So this is our this is a couple of the bits of our input data set. Um, so I've got a data set where I've just got a lot of um, countries. They're all the same in this table. I've got some categories where I've got my, my bar and liquid soaps. Um, I've got some different cities and units sold. Now, I know that part of my challenge is, is about to be going and forming together my profit. Um, so I don't have that within this first data set, but I do have a second table that will allow me to go and form that profit. And we've done that in a really simplistic way. So looking at our selling price per unit and working out our manufacturing costs and just taking one away from the other. But we do have some different costs based on the actual type of product we're looking at. So just by even sketching this out and thinking, of, thinking about this challenge, start to help me break this down. Um, so you'll see my sketches that I did for this section in a couple of slides time. But where do we want to get to? Well, the design today is I actually have a data table ready for this to go into. You'll see that I've got all of my data from Scotland across the first three months of 2019. So that works really nice and easily. Got my different categories. Well, they, they look pretty similar to what I had before, so that's okay. But you'll notice that in my type of soap, I've actually only got bar and liquid. I haven't got bar soap and liquid soap. So that was something else I potentially need to think about. So my category kind of matches what I have as that more granular city level data. And I have those profit numbers. So I've got this pretty clear outcome. It's nice. I just need to go and take my March data that's come in as that separate file for England for bar and liquid soap and just basically append that onto the end of our existing table. But my, by mapping those types of fields again and thinking about what I have in there, 
just helps to go and cement in, in my head what I've got. So I've got a date, I've got two different categories or categorical bits of information, and then I've just got a value on the end. So each of my months, as I was drawing this out, this is where I'm starting to see what's, come, what's happening, but I use the date of the 19th. So maybe that's when my Excel document's coming in. So I'm just capturing that as my record date. So I, I didn't really have that from that first table. So again, that's something else I need to start thinking about. I've got my countries, well, I've only got the England file coming in. The Scotland data for March is already there. Of my categories, yep, nice and clear within this table. Same within my England March feed. And it's just trying to form those pesky profit values. Um, that's going to be quite fun. So then after I've worked out what I need to do, I can start thinking about what those transitions are. So I need to go and join together my uh, manufacturing costs and my selling price um, onto my England table to actually go and work out not just how many units I've sold. I don't actually need that number in my end table. I need profit to go and form that profit calculation um, to go and start breaking that all down. So I'm going to have to do a union, to, uh, sorry, a join to do that. And that is pulling together those different values um, to create those additional columns on a single data set because every data store wants to work with one data table at a time where possible. Um, so we need to go and add our selling price and our manufacturing costs onto the end of this table, do a calculation to work out how many units were then sold for how much profit we've made. And then I need to go and aggregate my data up to a country level. So at the moment, we're a little bit lower. We do have obviously England as a value, but all of our rows of data, the granularity of our data, as we call it, is broken down to that city level. So we're going to have to go and use an aggregate step to go and kind of take that up to the higher level and sum up all of our profits that happen in England in, in this March timeframe. Also need to go and add that data in somewhere along the way. And then last but not least, once I've kind of got the data in a similar structure, so I would leave just month, country, category, and profit, then I can just go and union those bits together. And what that's going to look like is, is a flow that looks something like this. So maybe, and this is what happens sometimes, that I'll go and actually sketch out how the flow might work. Now, clearly, if you haven't used prayer very much, it's very unlikely that you would actually go and sketch out this as an idea. Um, but it would give you some ideas around what might need to happen when. So like I say, if you don't have that, then you might just kind of do some things in a different order. As long as you end up with kind of where we need to go and you've got the accuracy of data and you can go back through and test that, then you're going to be in a really good place. So for now, I'm going to dive out of my slides and just get prep kicked off. And we're going to go in and actually have a look at how we're going to go and build that. Um, so I'm using 2020.1.4, um, so the latest version that's out at the moment. And the data set that I've got, because it's three tables, that's, I've downloaded that into Excel. So this is week six, I'm sorry, from 2019, not the other example I'm showing. Um, so the input is there and it's on that challenges index on the prep and data site. So within the data, I actually have three different uh, sets of data. So I've got my England data, so that's where I've broken or got everything broken down by city. I've got my soap pricing details, and that's just really going to be looking through and just applying my metrics to work out my profit. And last but not least, I've got the data where I'm going to go and add my company data or append this data onto the end of this existing data set. As I mentioned yesterday, pretty much everything that I do within prep starts off with a clean step. It's just, for me, so much easier just to go and see that data, both in terms of the profile pane, as well as the actual examples down at the bottom for our data pane. Now, a couple of the icons that I didn't show yesterday that could be really useful here is the profile pane, I really like working from that. That's my personal preference. It's because I can go and see the outlier that actually I'm missing some data in March. If I click on March, I see that I've got March data for Scotland, but I haven't got any March data for England. I know that that's in this file. I've done the preparation for that. But actually, when we talk about the sketching, there's nothing stopping you going actually inputting the data and using the clean step to help you analyze what type of values I have, what type of data is Tableau Prep holding this or viewing this data as to understand what I've got within my data set. So maybe that actually helps you sketch. 
Now, what you could also do is just go and purely look at the data. So the second icon along the top of my profile pane menus um, just shows just a way to go and flick to be just the data. Or if your preference is to use things like the input step where you've just got the metadata, feel free to do that. I find that's the hardest one to work with. The data pane can be sometimes useful to kind of just really get down into that detail. But really, I do love this profile pane for, for jumping out and showing what's going on. So let's go and have a look at our first data set. So it's my detail um, of the units sold for each city. Uh, we've got some different categories going on within there. And we can kind of go and see how that breaks down by holding control. You can do multiple selects to go and see what each row basically entails. This helps you decide and define what the level of granularity of your data is. Now, this is a really great thing to do and something I advise lots of the classes at the data school to do when you're using level of detail calculations or when you're just working with data full stop. Because if you're not understanding what your granularity is, it becomes really difficult to go and make the right choices and write the right calculations that are going to return the responses that you want to return. So in our case, the first thing I thought about was having to join um, my soap pricing details to my England data to go and work out my profit. But if I actually look at my data sets that I have at the moment, and if I remember back from my planning, then I've actually got two different um, kind of types of soap. Here I have bar and liquid, but in my England data, I've got bar soap and liquid soap. Now as humans, we can look at that and we'll understand that they are very likely to be the same thing. It's just in our so pricing data, we're just missing the word soap off the end of there. So really quickly, I'm just gonna go and create a calculated field and I'm gonna go and take my type of soap. So I'm just starting to type in type of soap, press tab to fill in that autocomplete. And I'm just going to go, and because it's a string, add a, a plus with a quote mark, a space, the word soap, and close off that quote mark. So what that's going to do is that's going to take bar and then add after it a, a string that contains a space and the word soap off the back of it. Now, if I call that my type of soap, if you remember my little tip from yesterday, if you call the new field the same as an existing field, that's just going to overwrite that. Now, when I click on save, we've actually overwritten that field. So I've now got matching values that match between my two data sets for the way that I actually want to go and piece those together. So just a quick question from Chris has been, um, are the Excel tables on different sheets within the Excel workbook? In, in this case, it is. Um, you will only really see the table names coming in when you actually union those as, as we'll have a look at that later. Um, if they were all on the same Excel worksheet, remember we could use the data interpreter as we did yesterday in that example. So I've now got a way to go and join these data sets together. Off the back of the plus, I could go and set up a join step, or alternatively, I can drag one of my flows to the other and say whether I want to union or join it. Now, I did say about showing you how to connect different flows together. So I'm going to go and do the slightly longer way around, which is saying I want to go and join something onto my England data. And the way that I do that is I either grab the data set or the plus and drag it this time towards the front of the, the tool to almost act as something that's flowing into that tool and drop it on the ad. That creates the connection between my two data sets. But you'll notice I've got my error symbol, and that's because I haven't configured my join yet. Tableau, like Alteryx and a few other tools, will go and create a join based on uh, similar named fields, uh, especially on, around strings. But here my category and type of soap are actually different names. So I'm going to just go and set those manually myself. So category is equal to the type of soap. And you'll notice that I haven't got anything red within here. If you have any red values appear within your join step, that's really showing you that there's errors, there's mismatch fields. If you have loads of those, you have this little tick box at the top where you can only show those mismatch fields. Um, but another way to actually look at what's going on within your join step is actually this join configuration. So here we're setting up our join conditions. If you want to add multiple join conditions, you absolutely can. You can also change the operator. So whether something is equal to, not equal to, greater than or equal to, et cetera, within there. And there's some really neat things you can do with that, especially around a technique called scaffolding. You set your join type 
um, in a very different way to lots of the other tools. So lots of lots of tools, including Tableau Desktop, shows you this Venn diagram. So this idea of your left input and your right input and how you want to join these together. Here you'll notice I've just got the shading in the middle. So Tableau is telling me that I'm actually going to do an inner join. And what that means is we're going to bring back all of the rows of data where our category from our England data is equal to the type of soap. So the exact same match from our soap pricing details. They're the only rows we're going to go bring back. If something exists in our England data and doesn't have the pricing details, we're not going to include it. If we had, let's say, a third category for um, antibacterial soap, one of our favorite subjects of the time, then um, because we don't have that in our England data set, that wouldn't get brought back either. And a way to uh, analyze what's actually happening within your data set is to see what's included. Now you see that you've just got bars for the rows that were included. We've got six uh, rows of de uh, detail of data in my England data set, and we've got two within our soap pricing data set. If any rows were excluded, that basically gets added as another bar chart just to our right here. And you can see what's actually flowing out off the back of that data set too. Prep does make even join clause recommendations for you. So what clauses you might want to think about when you're actually setting that, that up. So there's a few different ways of looking at this. One thing that I'm always conscious of is actually really going and setting up your um, colors because it really helps to match through what you're going through here. If I change this tool, and edit that color to be the same blue, suddenly your join is a lot harder to match with what's going on where. So I try to avoid that as much as possible. You can do the names. I just find it so much quicker to actually just go and set that color in to make that as clear as possible between my data. And you have heard me mention yesterday that I also try and kind of play on color logic that are kind of yellow, I said a little bit more orangey here, and blue would mix together when we go and join them together to create green. It just helps me go and read that flow or pass that across to somebody else and let them see what's happening from there. So if I look at my join, I can see that I've got no mismatch of data. I can see my join results coming off the back of it. But again, that feels quite cramped in this right-hand side of the screen. So I'm going to go and add a clean step to see what effect we have. Well, I've got my country field. I know that I need that for the future. I've got my category. That's the same name as uh, what I have in my data set, whereas my type of soap. We're only bringing back where those exactly match. Um, so in that situation, we can actually just get rid of type of soap. Now, if your join was slightly different, let's say I wanted to always bring back everything from my England data, I can select that side of the Venn diagram. Tableau tells me I'm now doing a left join. And then I'd want to think about which um, uh, these data items I'd bring back. If I do a full join, then I'd want to actually leave both of those types of soap as well as the category in my data set because I might have something that exists in type of soap that doesn't exist within my category. And I don't really want to deal with nulls. But this, uh, this, the kind of Venn diagram is fully configurable for you to go and select exactly what you want to bring back from those joins. Again, that's part of the iteration of this. If you're not used to joins and you want to work through that logic, this is a great way to do that and go and see the effects of what you've got coming off the back of that. So um, again, the change of petting or the changes log that we saw yesterday, you can see that I've removed my type of soap, but everything else I need within my data set. Because my next challenge is to actually go and pull together my profit calculation. So I'm gonna go and create a calculated field. I'm gonna call it profit, so name it the same thing that's in my final data set. And I'm gonna do the calculation of the kind of raw profit per unit. So that's gonna be my, how much do I sell it for? minus my manufacturing cost. I'm going to wrap that in brackets just to make sure that gets calculated separately and then multiply that onto the actual number of units I've sold. Now what's happened is Tableau's added each of those manufacturing costs and unit prices based on the type of soap onto our existing sales. So that's why we can actually now go and pull this calculation together and work that through. Tableau tells me the calculation is valid. Remember, that's not saying that your calculation is right. It's just saying uh, the way you've constructed your calculation means the calcul uh, values will be returned from it. Doesn't necessarily mean that your, your calculation is bringing back profit. Tableau is not that clever that yeah, there yet, but I'd love it if it was in the future. So again, 
having the ability to go and look at the output from that, we can now see that profit has been brought back into our data set. And also you'll have heard me mention yesterday that when you're using Tableau Prep, any columns or data fields you're changing will get brought to the left-hand side of your screen. So that way you can actually see them rather than having to always scroll across to the right continually. Then we can actually go and check the maths if we wanted to. That's not a problem at all. But in this case, I've done this calc before, I'm comfortable with it. So that means I'm ready to actually go and start simplifying my data set. I can go and get rid of these extra columns that I no longer need. I can just go and select those, and then in the profile pane menu, just go and choose to remove those. And I've broken this data down to a data set, which kind of leaves everything in the same state as what I have coming in from my clean set. Country, category, profit, month. Oh, wait a second. I haven't actually got my month, and I don't want everything at the city level. So there's two different steps that I've kind of skipped all over. I've kind of raced ahead of myself way too quickly. That's really easy. I can just go and aggregate. I'm gonna go and aggregate up to a higher level than where we're at originally. So I don't want to have city in my data anymore. I know all of those cities exist within England. So I can group up to the level of England, but I have different profits for each of my different um, types of soap. So I'm gonna pull in category to break down the total of my profit for each country based on my, my bar and liquid soaps. So I want my overall profit for that. So what is happening within this aggregation step is if you haven't used this kind of idea before, our group by field is almost like our dimensions within um, Tableau Desktop. But whenever I bring out a number, so in this case, I'm summing my profit, that would be across my whole data set until I start breaking that down. And then we break this down by dimensions or our discrete fields within Tableau Desktop. But in prep, because we don't have dimensions and measures in the same way, we set our group bys to say for every combination of country and category. So in this case, we've only got one country, so that makes it easier. So for each bar and liquid types of soap, then we're going to get an individual profit number that comes off the back of that. If I wanted to just create one profit number across my whole data set, just drag those out of the way, then I could do and just leave profit in. That's almost like doing a fixed calculation if you're doing level of detail calculations in desktop against not breaking down by any dimensions. It's a similar piece of logic. So whatever you're used to, have a, have a work around with that aggregation step because it can be super useful and powerful. You can change the type of aggregation that you're doing. And you can also, instead of having to drag, you can actually just go and select the, the aggregation. If I just do average number of records from there, then that'll actually bring that into my aggregation step. So there's a few different ways to interact with this, but actually getting used to what happens is key. Because we saw yesterday with our kind of columns to rows that we were pivoting, but any that we didn't put into our setup, it actually meant that they were just carried through within our data. Well, that's not the same with our aggregation step. With our aggregation step, if I don't include anything within my group fields or my aggregated fields, it actually cuts out of my data set. Because here I'm saying I want to, I don't want to group by city. Um, I'm just going to go and aggregate up to the level of country instead. So what I'm going to come up with the back of this is actually a data set of only two items, of only two rows of data, rather than the six I had originally. Um, you can go and self-join back in from earlier um, setups. But we'll talk about that um, at a later date. That's kind of a little bit of a harder concept to wrap your head around if you haven't done that before. So just to show you what's happened to my data, you can now see I'm just down to those two individual rows, a profit number for my liquid soap and a profit number for my bar soap. So here I need to go and pick up my um, individual months, which I do have March in my data set name and I'm about to do a union. So I could wait to do it within there, but actually I'm just gonna make this quick and simple. Create a cal um, calculated field called month. That'll create me a new column in my data set called month. And I'm just gonna go and hard code the date. If this data set is something that's updating over time, then I'm definitely gonna want to go and ensure that I can do this in a more flexible way. But in this case, um, I'm just gonna go through the easier way, of just hard coding that date. So that will bring me back the 19th of March, 2019. <laughs> Sorry for any Americans on the line. We'll battle over our date formats for forever, I fear. 
So I now need to go and drop these two data sets together just to make it seem easier for what I'm about to do. Um, let's just go and do a darker green and then we'll see what's going to go on within that. There's nothing I need to do to this original company data. It's in the format that I want it to be. So in that case, I can just go and drag and go and union these two pieces together. When I release, you'll now see this table names piece come in. And this is where I could go and pick up my, my March data that's in within my table names and dynamically use that to actually form my date by doing some date parsing. I'm not gonna do that in this case. Um, so I'm just gonna make my life a little bit easier in that way. And you can see what's coming in from each side of your data. So where if you had different mismatched columns or different column names, you would start to see that playing through. You can see I've got some pesky nulls within my data set. So I just want to be super careful about what that's coming through from and why that's not being um, used quite the way that I want it to be. So if I go back to my months, I've got my 19th of March, that should be fine. And if I go through to this data set, should be adding that on to the end. Um, but when I'm through my data set, I'm noticing that that March isn't being added on for some reason. Um, oh, that stumped me. That's not done this before. That's fun. Um, so the output from my month, just going to have to move some zoom pieces around. That's really bizarre. Interesting. I love it when prep conf confounds me as well just to add some extra fun. Let me just go and check my calculation. So to edit a calculation, you can go back into your changes pane and we're forcing that to be a date and I haven't got any dodgy spaces within there. That should be absolutely fine. So not sure why that's not playing ball. Um, I love it, never work with technology, children or animals, hey? One of them will get you one way or the other. So what I'm just gonna do is I'm just gonna shortcut this and I'm just gonna group those two values together. And because I had nulls within there before, um, basically the, where I actually have an active value, that will overwrite. And I'm gonna go and have a look at uh, why that was going wrong. That, that completely confuffled me, but there we go. I don't need my table names. That's not got any information that I'm gonna need going forward. So I can just go and get rid of those. Um, but those table names make it a little bit easier. Actually, if I just undo that change, if I didn't know that not those nulls were coming in from the other side and just go back before my removal of those, if I want to look at where those nulls were coming from, you can see it's everything coming in from that soap pricing data. So that's a, that's a way to actually go and see what's going on within that. But as we don't need them, we can just go and get rid of them. And that would leave me with my data set that's nice and clean, nice and complete, and actually ready to go off the back of that. And we will be able to just go and output that. So my final step, clicking on the plus, again, just gonna need to move my zoom controls, and go and select output. We've got our data set and we could go and choose how we're actually gonna go and publish that and then visualize that data. But for us, that's a nice, clean, clear set of data that we can then go and work with. And if we wanted to update that, we absolutely could. So quite a few steps within there. And if we jump back to our slides, you know, we, we spoke about having a join. We, we spoke about having to go and join that pricing, that, that England data together. And we've got to go and work out how to make that join condition. So you might have spotted about the bar soap, liquid soap, not being the same without the word soap there. So if you hadn't planned for that, that you would have quickly seen that as you've gone through into that join step. Otherwise, then we created our profit calculation and we aggregated up to our country level. I almost forgot to do that, but I inspired my notes, so I did go back to do that. And then we unioned that back together. In that case, I had that weird quirk with the date, um, which didn't happen as I've done this before. So <laughs> I'm gonna dig into that a little bit. But all in all, that puts together the data in the way that we want it. And we can go through and compile that together. That makes life nice and easy for us. And it really is the, the planning of the prep makes life so much easier rather than having to work it out on the fly as i go through you can get more used to that but you also like to miss things you're likely to overlook stages that you need to do or potentially you're likely to make mistakes as you go through um, by planning your prep as you get more experience you'll start to notice some of those harder challenges where you have to do certain things in a certain sequence that experience will help you understand those a lot sooner 
And rather than having to kind of iterate through as much, you'll kind of be more likely to get it right the first time. So it is a way to go and save yourself time overall. And also, I can promise you, you will be taking on more and more harder challenges as you go through your prepping experience. And that's really where planning your prep, getting on the front foot with that makes life so much easier. So just like we do with dashboards, feel free to sketch. That will help you understand both what's in that input data set, where you want to get to, and therefore the likely steps that you're going to make in between that. But for now, that, that's it on planning your prep. Tomorrow we're going to get into more of the technical in terms of actually how do you go and shape your data using steps we've seen like aggregation today, union, and joins, but some other tools along the way too. So for now, I'm going to hand it over to you for questions. If you want to drop your questions into the chat, feel free, or if you want to take yourself off mute and ask them, that's also fine as well. And then um, if not, I will see you at the same time tomorrow, or um, I'll share the recording, like I say, on the meetup group off the back of this, and I'll tweet it out as well. So thanks for joining us, everyone. Feel free to drop if you want to, or hang around for the questions. So the first question around, um, does PrEP you, uh, allow you to bring in data from Tableau Server? It does now. It, it didn't in the initial early versions of Tableau PrEP Builder, but I can now go and connect to Tableau Server as my, as my data source. Um, that, that's really powerful, especially when we start thinking about PrEP Conductor, of using existing data sources and actually going and appending on additional information, whether that's models you've built within the Excel, so my girlfriend is a kind of financial modeler and kind of builds a whole load of different projections, et cetera. So for her to be able to go and append details uh, from existing data sources onto those models that she has to build elsewhere, that becomes super useful to do that. So yeah, you can absolutely consume data from Tableau Server. Also, if you're thinking of Tableau Server as the Postgres database that sits underneath that, you have got that connection to Postgres. So you can analyze using prep, and start forming together some of those tough connections that you need to do to get Postgres ready for analysis, uh, to look at all of that kind of different usage of what you've got going on within the server and explore how Postgres is knitted together. So yeah, there's some, there's some good things you can do with that as well. So if you're consuming data um, from Tableau Server, um, I hadn't actually thought about what level of detail or of access that you need. I would have thought that viewer would be fine because it's just there as a data source, but I'm actually going to take that question away. Um, so bonus points for Ramesh for completely stumping me with a good question around, can every role within the Tableau server actually use the server as a data source? My natural answer is yes, but I'm going to go away and check that to make sure that's the case. Um, questions coming in saying, have I had experience with SAP HANA? Yes, but a long time ago. So probably looking at about seven years ago now. Um, it's actually the largest data set I've ever used in Tableau, which is three and a half billion rows um, that was held on SAP HANA. So super fast connections, super fast querying and processing, um, but also pretty, pretty expensive along the way as well. Another question coming in around, is Tableau, Tableau Prep Builder available on Tableau Public? Not at the moment. And I, and I say that knowing no plans apart from me requesting continually to every member of the marketing and dev team in Tableau that I know that I would love Tableau Prep Builder to be available on Tableau Public. Now, one thing that Tableau did at the conference last year was reveal that they're going to build Tableau Prep to work in browser. So in the server, you'll soon be able to edit your flows I say the word soon, I don't know when soon is, I should change that. Um, it's therefore likely or possible that over time we might be able to get Tableau Prep Builder on Tableau Public, because obviously it's a lot more of a web-based tool. Um, but yeah, no guarantees at the moment. And, and for the moment, you need to have a Tableau Creator license um, to be able to use Tableau Prep Builder or sign up for the 14-day trial and learn off the back of that. But apart from that, um, we haven't, haven't got a huge amount more on using Tableau Prep in public at the moment, um, but I'm intentionally trying to build all of those materials so as people do get access to Tableau Prep Builder, then they can hit the ground running with that. Uh, 
Uh, really, really interesting question from um, Rich, which is kind of more of a, a point rather than a question, but it, it is super useful around if you're using joins, demonstrating exceptions. Um, so what we've passed is a left outer, a right outer. So that's where something doesn't match your conditions that you're setting. Um, that's, that's a really useful example, especially within data prep. Because if you expect all of your data to meet the type join conditions that you're actually putting together, those join clauses, if suddenly they don't, they're probably the things that you actually need to prepare and clean up a lot more. Um, so actually using within my join step, um, maybe potentially a second join step. So what's nice is you can add a separate join step on, join those things together. And then if you were setting up a, a join where you're setting a condition, and we know all of these match. So this is a poor data set to do this with. But if something didn't match, setting up the either the left only, or you could do right only, but I'd probably treat each of those individually. And then having a flow that stems from there to actually go and deal with that, that data that I would expect to, to be cleaned up, allows me to go and actually go and build that into a separate join step if necessary. I won't destroy this flow too much. Um, but learning and having that ability to treat data differently at different points and then put it either back into the mix or kick it out as an, an output to go and clean up, then that would be super useful. Um, so yes, you, you'll see that quite a lot. And another question from Rich around the need for zooming, zooming in and out and seeing what's going on within your prep flow and where. Um, if I just select one of my steps, you'll see this 100%. There's some really nice steps with here, here that I can actually zoom out and I can zoom out really far if I want to. But um, the way to just go and fit your full flow is actually just kind of this little square icon that will then go and zoom into the level to be able to go and see everything from end to end. Now I've seen some pretty gnarly flows um, to say the least where they're absolutely huge. And you probably don't always want to be able to fit those in. So what you actually have is this ability, if I zoom in a bit more so I get a bit of zoom, I can click on my up arrow. And what that lets me do is actually just go and select different parts of my flow and move that around, or it should do, there we go. So I can actually move this overall square around to actually go and navigate across my flow. So there's some quite useful controls that are just hidden away under this, um, what normally shows is just 100%. Um, that came in in uh, probably about two or three versions ago. And it is the, 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 these pesky little things that you kind of don't always notice. And again, that's why I try and read those, those kind of release notes. Because um, certainly from the prep side, they're coming thick and fast. And some of the stuff's not relevant every single time. Um, but some of those changes are super cool and super useful. A uh, question from Michael around, um, how do you display multiple input files of a similar format. So if I want to go and connect to another Excel, let's just go and pick up week two. Um, I haven't had to do that this much. So this is gonna be fun to see how this actually plays out. Open that up. And you actually see the kind of like Tableau desktop, you get these kind of two ideas of two different data sources, and then you can go between those to get the underlying sheets from within that. So if I want to go and pick up something from my new data source, go and drop it into my uh, data set, you'll now see that I've just got that as another data point that I can actually just go and use and start um, merging that stuff together. That's a slightly slightly different approach, um, but you just get another um, different input that you can then go and play from there. If you're connecting to a database that's huge, um, so with one of the companies that I've worked for, I had a quarter of a million tables within a, in a SQL environment then actually um, you'll see that as a big drop down list if there's a huge number of sheets, et cetera, underneath. Or if you have within that SQL environment, you've got different databases, you'll see that as a drop down list, first of all. And then you can go and search through, hence the search box at the top, or the actual kind of drop down list to be able to go and navigate your way through there. Loving these questions, everybody. This is, this is some good stuff. All right, the questions seem to have stopped for the moment. So maybe I'm gonna take a breath. We'll leave the session there. And then tomorrow we're gonna to go and talk all about shaping that data. Because I think that's that's one of the kind of harder things just to go and wrap your hands around. If you're kind of newer to shaping data of 
if I use different steps, what's that going to do to my data? How is that going to change the shape of the data? And actually getting you to be deliberate with that is, is really, is really cool and good fun. Um, and that's where you really start to feel like you're controlling and getting your hands around this thing a bit more rather than it doing things that you're not fully expecting. And that's where I'd love to get you to by the end of the week. So again, tomorrow, shaping data, the day after, um, we'll dive into a lot more around when do you not need to use Tableau Prep um, and therefore when do you? And um, tomorrow's session will be the same. So it's the same link as we're gonna use today for the Zoom call. Um, but if not, just go back to the Meetup page, Let's Talk Data, and you'll find all the details on there for tomorrow's session as well. So thank you, thank you for all the nice comments. Thank you for all the questions. That makes it way more fun for me, thinking about other bits and pieces. Um, and for you guys testing me, I always love that. And um, so I really appreciate you really for joining and we'll stop the recording there. So thanks everybody and speak to you tomorrow. Again, contact me on Twitter if you've got any questions in the meantime. All right, thanks everyone.